Hello guys, welcome back to the channel and welcome to a new video. In this video, I would like to share with you a breakdown of how I train for the 2023 Ironman World Championship in Nice, France. One of the toughest courses in the Ironman circuit and arguably the hardest event I have ever prepared and trained for to date. The course is brutal, the conditions also can be, and the fact that I was going to be towing the start line with some of the best and fittest age group athletes in the world made it even more exciting and daunting. So for these reasons, I really wanted to train the best that I could and become the fittest that I could. The preparation was far from perfect, mostly due to heavy outside stresses, injury, but training wise, I really felt I pushed myself beyond what I had ever done before. The sessions were harder, the progress was visible. In this prep, I doubled down on what I saw worked for Hamburg and previous Ironmans, whilst having to rethink and include different kinds of stimuli to better suit the very hard race I was getting myself into. Before getting stuck in the details, a word from the sponsor of today's video. Today's video is sponsored by AG1. AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I've been using AG1 for the past month now and it has become a staple in my morning routine. It is my go-to drink first thing in the morning every day. Doing this simple thing helps me ensure that I'm getting comprehensive nutrition to support my lifestyle. AG1 contains a broad spectrum of micronutrients and phytonutrients to keep the body nourished all day, every day, as well as rhodiola, magnesium and B vitamins to support energy throughout the day. It's packed with 75 vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients and combines the perfect amount of micronutrients, absorption and taste, all in a simple, effortless daily habit. One scoop with water is all it takes. And on top of that, it tastes great. Keep your routine even on the go with the convenient travel packets, which make sticking to this healthy habit easy and convenient, which is especially useful when traveling to races or events. Go to drinkag1.com slash to get started on your order. AG1 is gonna give my community a free one year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Thanks to AG1 for sponsoring today's video. Okay, back to the train. I wanted to prove to myself, to the best of my abilities, that I could be a worthy back of the pack athlete at an Ironman World Championship even if it were Nice. It is undeniable that there is a big difference in qualifying between Nice and Kona. Kona is a lot harder to qualify for. But in 2023, I thought I'm gonna give this my best shot. I had qualified with a roll down slot and this had given me the once in a lifetime opportunity to train harder than I ever had, make progress and try and put it all out there on race day. Let me share with you how I did it, hoping you might find some useful points to integrate in your own train. I believe that this video could be especially useful if you are preparing for an Ironman with a hilly bike. I truly believe that this time I built on the past experience and expanded on it with new techniques, protocols and strategies that led to some pretty significant breakthroughs. The Ironmans I have done up to this point had all been lake swims, flat bike, and a couple of them with hilly marathons, namely Tallinn, and one with a flat marathon. Nice was going to challenge me by the sheer nature of the course. A 3.8 kilometer open water sea swim, very likely to be non-wetsuit legal, which would have been a first for me. A 180 kilometer single loop bike route with a whopping 2,400 meters of elevation gain, exposed to heat, wind, and adverse conditions. And then the marathon, 42.2 kilometers, taking place starting at midday in a fierce and unforgiving Promenade des Anglais, surrounded by concrete, buildings, and without a lick of shade to be found, anywhere on the course. I was actually trusting in the conditions to be favorable. In September, it is very normal for the Mediterranean weather to be cool or at least bearable. But in training, I did factor in the worst case scenario. The fundamental guidelines for the training were stay consistent. Stay as consistent as possible by avoiding overtraining, injury, getting sick. Consistency for any Ironman prep is the most important thing in my opinion. And this was especially true for the preparation of an important event like a world championship. Quality over quantity. Even though for Hamburg, I had taken a very much high volume approach, adding in zone two bikes, etc., and had found great benefit from it, actually. For this race, I decided to really make an effort to nail the key speed, strength, and long sessions on the bike and run, sticking to the plan as much as possible. No extra volume or very minimal and no junk sessions, but especially no failed sessions. 
In every session, I wanted to really hit the numbers that were required, trained specific to the race and race conditions. Replicating the same climbs, the same times of day, heat, etc. I really thought this to be critical. I had some decent standard Ironman fitness from the training I had done previously in the season. Now I needed to improve it and especially mold it to the specifics of the race I was going to do. As a fundamental guideline for all the training, I used the Motive app. I had found it very useful for Hamburg. I knew that it worked and I decided to stick with it. Ironman training is TSS based. So training stress score or TSS was going to be the guide for the build. The Motive app provides all the training sessions, the periodization and the recovery and taper indications tailored to my specific zones. The standard training week was the same as Hamburg and consisted in Monday, rest day or at most a recovery ride, super low intensity, 60 minutes. Tuesday, a hard interval bike and a brick run. Wednesday was a hard low cadence strength bike and strength swim with long sets and paddle. Thursday was a hard tempo run and a strength session. Friday was a recovery swim and a recovery bike. Saturday was a long ride and a brick run and Sunday was a swim plus a long run. A lot of people ask me, did you really only use motive for your training? No coach. And yes, I did only use motive. But the thing to bear in mind is I've studied Ironman training quite extensively in the past years. And this takes a lot of time. That, that is something that not many people do. I'm not at the level of a coach, but I would say I have an understanding of it. So it wasn't like I was following a plan blindly. I could make tweaks. I could modify and adapt the plan to things that might've been happening in my life. Or I could try and make up for missed sessions or make the call to let them go make them a bit longer, make them a bit shorter. And generally I had control of my training load. And secondly, I use Motive, but the thing is Motive doesn't know what kind of Ironman you're doing. It doesn't know if you're doing a very hilly Ironman. So I had to make a lot of tweaks to the training plan to accommodate this. So the train specific to the race that I was going to do. So yes, I did prepare using only an app, but with these modifications and things that you should keep in mind. Let's dig into the training specifics of the single discipline. So after Hamburg, I thoroughly analyzed what my weaknesses were in the swim and two stood out. One was arm strength. I was simply missing some upper body strength slash endurance to sustain a given speed for 3.8 kilometer continuous. And two, sighting. A big problem in Hamburg had been sighting the boys and lifting my head too much every time I needed to sight. This made it so every time I would sight, my legs would sink, so I would slow down and have to work harder to get back up to speed, etc. And this would lead to my technique breaking down. Also, poor sighting leads to over distance swimming, which is never good. So you swim in a zigzag, you don't know where you're going, and you're swimming more than you should need to swim. I wanted to focus on sighting smoothly, efficiently, which I thought would result in a better swim. To date, my best swim, best, had been in Tallinn, where I swam a 150 per 100 pace, but that actually resulted in a 154 split per 100 because all the zigzagging and poor sighting I did there. So basically I swam a lot more than I should have. Better sighting would improve my swim and make me more efficient. To try and improve these two aspects, I doubled down on toys. I swam a lot with paddles two months out in July. I did this especially out in open water with pool boy, paddle and a snorkel. This is something I would usually only do in the pool, but I did it open water also. I would do long sets with this setup, 1000 meters plus, and my arms were consistently toast after these sessions. A feeling that was hard to achieve without these toys. Paddles also helped me feel the water and get my stroke a bit better. Feel the imbalances when I was breathing, for instance, how much I pulled on one side versus the other side and gliding. I used three different sized paddles, S, M and L, but switched for a solid two weeks to only using the L size paddles. So big paddles for long sets. I swam quite a lot in open water, at hours of the day when sighting was the most complicated. So dawn and early morning especially, to replicate the race day morning. For sighting, it was about watching a lot of YouTube tutorial vids and then applying the knowledge in the water. This led to some pretty drastic changes. I realized the reason I was losing so much speed during sighting was because my timing was off. I was breathing, then putting my head back in the water and then lifting my eyes up to sight and then breathing again. This meant that the moment in which my body was the most susceptible to sinking hips was exactly when I was sighting. I changed this after watching, I think it was an NVDM coaching vid in which it explained and showed to breathe and then sight straight away in order to be sighting during the most optimal phase of the stroke when the hand is entering the water and lengthening. Then the head goes back down for the pull phase. This I felt made me more efficient, more calm when sighting and didn't get me out of breath or didn't let my hips sink. Another thing I did that was new was including open water sessions with a pull buoy, band and paddles. Sometimes I would even throw a snorkel in there. 
This was done with the objective of just logging as many kilometers in the arms as possible, even if it meant using toys. I'd seen many people do this in videos and even sometimes live when I was at the sea in Italy. And in my opinion, after this build, it is a very valid training protocol to include in your build. Paddles point out flaws in technique by exacerbating them and provide a solid strength-based workout to reinforce the upper body muscles. One aspect I just didn't do was training in the sea without a wetsuit. I didn't have access to going to the sea because of personal reasons, but I figured that the sea would hopefully be calm in Nice, so kind of like a lake. And the buoyancy of the sea is basically the same as swimming in a lake with a wetsuit. I had already in my life done multiple two kilometer continuous swims in the ocean, just in my jammers, so I knew what it felt like. I figured I could manage. Be sure to subscribe to the channel to see the race breakdown video when it comes out and find out if this plan actually worked out or if it was a colossal fail. Final key session was topping out at a 144 pace per 3,800 continuous in a 25 meter pool. Swim in which I practiced sighting every length of the pool basically. Honestly, for the small amount of training I did, I was happy with the result. Open water swimming was going to be slower because of the no pushing off the wall every length, but I had definitely made improvements compared to Hamburg prep. I felt more confident, more smooth and efficient in the water with less fatigue. For the bike, it was in some ways going to be similar, but in others radically different from previous preparations. Preparing for a one loop course with a lot of climbing needed me to rethink the protocols I was using previously in the year, which had been used to get better at speed on flat land in the aero position. And I needed to incorporate ways to get better at climbing. Climbing means sustaining a high wattage for a period of time, the climb, and then recovering. The intensity that you need to hold on climbs is higher than generally Ironman pace. So this was going to be something that I had to figure out. Other technical aspects to consider were aero was going to be important, but also weight, both of me and the bike. But for sure, the main thing I realized that I really needed to focus on and to include was training and adapting my body to climbing. Climbing efficiently means maintaining a constant power output higher than Ironman effort in order to optimize the time spent climbing. So basically make up time and then recovering on the descents. How hard you can push up the climb and then sort of recover from was going to be a key factor. The other factor was going to be that the bike was not going to be a four hour and 15 minutes length bike, but it could possibly be quite a lot longer. I didn't really know how long since I wasn't familiar with the terrain and the bike course was going to be different from the traditional Ironman Nice course as they added a rolling 10 kilometers to make the course a legit 180 kilometer Ironman distance with 2,400 meters of climbing. This meant I couldn't go off the times of the previous events to get an exact idea, but I could ballpark it at 10 kilometers, 20 extra minutes on the traditional time. This needed to be factored in as fueling and hydration goes, as well as just being used to being on the bike for a long time, possibly one hour or one hour and a half extra or even two and then running to the best of my abilities off of it. I took two weeks off from Hamburg and then I approached the bike training in two phases, starting from the 19th of June. A general climbing slash long bike effort. This meant specifically gravel and climbing a lot. Epic rides on the gravel bike. I hit a couple of the most famous rides here in Italy, including Colle delle Finestre, Assietta, Colombardo, climbing for hours, many times on uneven terrain. This I found to be incredibly helpful. Climbing on gravel, oftentimes means it's very challenging and we are forced to push a lower cadence compared to road. This made my legs adapt very quickly to over gearing and pushing power for hours. It's not unusual on gravel rides to have to climb for two plus hours. And this is most times a power based effort using the legs a lot at a low cadence. Man, this part of training was awesome. I did some truly epic rides in particular. Colle delle Finestre, Strada della Sietta, in true honesty, a gravel paradise. It was an epic experience that I'm glad I fit into training. I'm gonna be making a video about it, as well as the Nivole crossing, a 210 kilometer route, which included a two hour hike and bike section. It was just epic. Then I transitioned into a specific TT bike prep. Once I had done a ton of climbing, eight plus hour rides without being specific. The final six weeks I rode as similar to the race conditions as possible on my TT bike. This meant also some of the midweek rides, especially the interval session would be often done on the TT bike. And especially the long ride on Saturdays would be as similar as possible to the Nice bike course. I would do a flat section starting out, then a big climb, a descent, then a second mid-size climb, a descent and a final flat section. As I stated in the beginning of the vid, the approach to training was quality over quantity. And this was especially true on the bike. I made sure to hit all the sessions 
to the best of my abilities before adding in more volume. This meant using motive and always aiming for the higher power number in the range prescribed for intervals or tempo or the long run. During the week, I would do on Tuesday a hard interval session. Let me give you some examples of what these sessions would look like. Repeat the following sequence five times. Five minutes effort in mid to high zone four, so target 290, 310 watts. Three minutes easy spin, or a 15 minute warm up with some surges, and then repeating this sequence four times. 2.5 minutes fast zone five, so above 311 watts, basically all out, 90 seconds easy spin. Five minute easy spin, and then repeating the same thing again. So four times, 2.5 minutes, fast zone five, 90 second easy spin. This being a training build, the next week would be, repeat the following four times, three minutes fast zone five, above 311 watts, one minute easy spin. Five minutes easy spin, and then repeating the same thing four times. Three minutes fast zone five, one minute easy spin. So every week was progressing. Either the power number became higher, or the recovery got shorter. This is basically how intervals work. On Wednesday, I would have a low cadence strength workout on the bike. This would look like the main ones basically were 15 minutes warm up and then repeating five times at the top of zone three, four minutes at a 60, 70 cadence with a target of 247, 268 watts, two minutes, 50, 60 cadence, target 269, 290 watts, one minute easy spin. These strength sessions and intervals were quite brutal. I always aimed at the higher power number and a couple of times I literally don't know how I managed to make it, seriously. These two were key sessions and just like every other event, the closer I got to race day, I had to resort to swapping the sessions, putting the steady low cadence strength session on Tuesday, which was hard but felt more manageable and I could hit the numbers I needed to hit and the hard interval session on a Wednesday. Doing the intervals on a Tuesday was simply impossible for me as I was still so fatigued from the weekend and I was not recovered. I could not hit the intensity required to go really hard. So I swapped them. Friday would be a recovery ride. So a zero intensity ride, just getting out there and getting some blood pumping, which in actuality helps with recovery. More blood flow is always good. Saturday was a long ride followed by a brick run. The Saturday long ride, as I said before, mimicked the knees course almost all the times. I would go out looking to simulate the terrain and intensity I would do on the knees bike course and the heat as well. These would look like five to six hour rides, hitting the climbs hard and recovering on the downhills. I trained all sessions outside, no smart trainer, because I wanted to train as specific to the course as possible. So actual climbs and working the exact same muscles that I would be using on race day. This bike training really pushed me further than I thought, both physically and mentally. There were some times when I just didn't have it. A couple of rides, I just felt empty from the start and they were some of the most intense struggles I've ever been on. Starting out a six hour ride with climbs, knowing you will have to run 30 minutes after, feeling like is not ideal. This was probably due to a couple of times in which I overdid the hard run session on Thursday and the recovery ride on Friday, or maybe coupled with poor sleep and voila, the stage is set for a struggle bus ride. This only led me to believe and understand that recovery is crucially important. More on that later. One very important thing I did was a full bike course recon one month before race day, treating it as the final big ride. I made a video about the course. If you want to check it out, I'll leave it the link here. And this session was very useful to get acquainted with the course, but especially to see what power and intensity I could hold realistically during the race, as well as practicing nutrition, getting a feel for what the temperature would be like, seeing and registering important landmarks for the course, which I could use as milestones during the race. Another really interesting thing that the bike course recon showed me was exactly what kind of grade the knees climbs were going to be like. They were far mellower than what I had been training on in the Alps. So from the recon onwards, I made sure I trained on more easy, steady grade climbs and descents. Because also descents, if they are mellow, they require you to push power. In NNEs, that is the case. The results of the bike training were, now my FTP went up from 289 to 294, and my body weight went down from 71 to 69 kilograms. This meant I went from 4.07 watts per kilo to 4.26. Not a big jump, but progress nonetheless. All time best 30, 60, 90 minute power multiple times throughout the build and hitting some solid for me, 60 minute power numbers during the final big session in Nice up Col de Lec. If the bike was going to be quality over quantity, the run was going to be so even more. 
I took quite a break after Hamburg just to give the legs time to recover. And then I resumed with some easy trail running, which took me in the mountains and alternating run slash power hiking, which I find to be taxing on the cardio system and the legs power wise, but a bit mellower on the joints than road running and all that impact. Also being out in nature is simply put super cool. I love it. It's invigorating, it's inspiring and a key ingredient for my quality of life, basically. I would definitely recommend getting out in the mountains for some trail runs to anyone. After a mellow reintroduction of running, I hit the sessions in the plan to the best of my abilities, doing Tuesday a brick run off the bike. This was a short brick run, maybe 15, 30 minutes, just to get the legs moving. Thursday, a hard tempo run. This would be around one hour to 80 minutes with some long, hard efforts in it. The tempo range prescribed, I would always try and hit the faster numbers. And these sessions were brutal. I had already done some of these in prep for Hamburg, but not really this intense. But this time I doubled down on doing them as I saw the progress they allowed me to achieve. Saturday would be a short brick run off the bike and Sunday would be a classic long run. The long runs ranged from 17 up to 27 kilometers. And in these runs, there would be some race specific blocks or even some blocks faster than race pace. The key final session and the longest run was a 27 kilometer run with 10 kilometers warm up at 5 minute K pace with the Nike Invincible, then switching to the Nike Alpha Fly mid run and running 17 kilometers straight at target Ironman marathon pace. This session I would consider a breakthrough because I could see basically the results of the training I had done. As I did the whole session without feeling fatigued and doing the 17 kilometers at Ironman marathon pace at a heart rate of 149 at 423 pace. I felt great, also due to the fact that it was cool weather. And now I knew what intensity my legs could sustain while feeling fresh. The problem was going to be A, maintaining this intensity after a demanding bike like the Nice one, and B, dealing with the heat, which would increase my heart rate during the event. 423 pace at the top of zone two for me is great, but in the heat, I don't know if it would hold up. So the run results and progress, I did all time best 10 kilometer times and all done unintentionally during longer runs while doing a tempo effort, culminating in around a 43 minute 10 420 pace with a heart rate just above the zone two cap at 158 during a tempo session, which for me is quite good. During this session, I also did a 20 minute 5K. I've never trained, nor I have ever done a full all out five kilometer or 10 kilometer effort. These were all tempo efforts. Strength training was something I had started including during the prep for Hamburg and I kept at it for Nice. Core strength, quad and leg strength, and a focus on durability of the body, plus some upper body stuff. To be completely honest though, compared to Hamburg, I did quite a bit less strength training because I was just too tired to handle it. But I made sure that I nailed at least the core really specific exercises to keep that kind of stuff on point because it is really important for running. Okay guys, I'm here editing and I just realized I forgot one part that might be useful. The total training times. Between June 6th and September the 9th, I did 141 hours on the bike, so 75% of the training, 30 hours running, 16% of the training, swimming I did 8 hours, so 4.3% of training, and strength 4 hours, so 2%. The main training months were July and August. In July, I did 70 hours of training and in August, 67 hours, which means that the average per week, June, July and August, so including the recovery basically month from Hamburg, I did an average of 14 hours per week, with the biggest week being one 23 hour week, so less than Hamburg. Another value that might be important is the fitness. So basically, my starting fitness was 105. My max fitness went up to 125 and my event day fitness was 105. So basically, if we looked at the chart on training peaks, it would seem that I did not make any progress. But in my opinion, in this build, it does not tell the whole story at all. It is just basically calculations on how much you've trained and how much you're training. And it doesn't really re reflect your fitness. I believe that I got a lot fitter during this build. So those were the totals, back to the video. For recovery, I doubled down on strategies I knew to work. The first life-changing strategy is compression. I would finish every session and wear compression socks and even sometimes full compression tights to promote blood flow and speed up recovery from hard sessions or from the long rides and runs. And I coupled this with heat. I would apply heating packs to muscles and tendon insertions specifically on the calves and the Achilles tendon. If you've made it this far in the video, this is arguably one of the biggest takeaways from it that can improve your recovery. 
Heat plus compression is the holy grail of speeding up and increasing blood flow to areas that need repair. I've said this in almost every video in the past year, but people are still kind of wary to try the strategy. Maybe it just seems too simple to be effective. Well, major brands like Hyperice, etc., are now making heating pads. Normatec boots are basically compression socks on steroids, so I really encourage you to try this out. Really, trust me on this one. This strategy is also key, in my opinion and experience, to keep muscles and tendons supple and not pulling on each other or being tight, which eventually could lead to injury. I slept a ton as much as possible. I enhanced this by limiting caffeine to no later than 10.30 a.m. Maybe a couple of times I had a coffee after lunch, but maybe it would be a one-off. Mostly 10.30 a.m. was a cutoff. Caffeine has a half-life of six to eight hours, so it can easily impact sleep. Also, I started taking magnesium in the evening. Another thing I did was made sure to eat my last meal as early as possible in order to leave at least two hours before eating and sleeping. This I found to make a big difference because the first part of digestion impacts sleep, making it a bit restless. So eating early and allowing a time buffer before bed, I really felt made a difference. Another thing I also did was I tended to avoid super sugary foods slash sweets in the evening, as I found them to rev me up too much and basically damage my sleep quality a bit. I opted more for starches, such as rice, potatoes, pasta, most often combined with peas or a protein source, a vegetable and some salad. If I still felt like something sweet after, I would just eat some fruit. Fruit after starches is not ideal digestion wise, but I actually never had any adverse reaction. To get deep sleep, I would wear an eye mask overnight. It's pretty crazy how much light actually is in our rooms unless we have true blackout curtains. So a mask ensures that we can block out all light. And personally, I like sleeping with the blinds half open so that I can wake up with the morning light. I would go to bed as early as possible and not set an alarm clock for the next day in order for my body to wake up when it was ready and had done repairing itself. This meant mostly being in bed by nine and waking up at around 6 a.m. Also, some days after lunch, naps were quite common. For nutrition, I stuck to a high carb, moderate protein diet, exactly like for Hamburg. It was a plant-based protocol, which I find has good benefits in my personal experience, but it's highly personal. And I included essential amino acids to ensure that I got all the building blocks that my body needed to repair itself protein-wise. Overall, recovery was the area where I had the worst time of all the aspects of this preparation. For personal reasons, I was forced for the last month and a half to be driving upwards of three hours a day and eating very late, sometimes even 10 p.m. I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but these things, which were far more important than training and non-negotiable, really impacted my recovery hard. Driving a lot is, in my opinion, the worst thing you can do during a training block like this. Hours spent sitting in a cramped space makes our muscles seize up reduces blood flow, and in general, just made me cranky compared to recovering on the couch or at a desk. Some days my recovery was so impacted I would feel drained of energy, and it was a miracle that I could get the sessions done. And this impacted my mood, my job, creating content for this channel, and overall life quality. My creativity was completely shut off during the last six to seven weeks of this preparation, which is not nice, to be honest. I definitely stretched and overreached my capabilities in this last period, not so much training-wise, but with the recovery. But I knew it was going to be just a moment in my life, so I pushed through. You can only train as much as you can recover from. Never a more true statement was said about training load, intensity, and the importance of recovery. And hey, honestly, you won't find me complaining about the way this recovery went, as in it was just some added stresses very similar to what anyone with a family, kids, and a demanding job would experience. Day-to-day -day nutrition was pretty straightforward and basic. The foundation was carbs, mostly rice, potatoes, and pasta. Protein was peas, legumes, coro protein powder, coro soy crispies, and seitan once a week. Essential amino acids every morning, nine grams, and after lunch, nine grams. Essential amino acids in the quantity of nine grams should equal, and this is just something that I read around, should be equal to around taking in the 30 grams of traditional protein recommended. So I thought this was a good strategy to just ensure I was covering my basis. For more information about this, refer to the sub 10 hour Ironman training for Hamburg video. For the race nutrition, I was going to build on the prior knowledge and experience I had had in previous events. Why am I including this in the training video? because this is a critical aspect to test and trial in training to avoid having unexpected problems on race day. Practice, practice, practice. The same gels, the same timing, or at least as close as possible to race day. The midweek sessions honestly didn't really require much fueling during sessions as they weren't quite long. I would take a gel with me, but normally I could easily get them done without taking in 
much. The key sessions on the weekend were basically always race simulation nutrition wise. 120 grams per hour on the bike of carbs coming from endurance energy unit drink and gels, four endurance gels, in addition to the art of vegan ice cream and Coca-Cola. I did an almost exact race simulation with the Nice Course Recon, minus the water, because not having eight stations meant I had to do with a bit less liquids, but I tested out all the nutrition strategy and man, 120 grams of carbs on the bike, or as high as you can go, if you can take in more without having the stress, go for it. This makes a big difference in ensuring I didn't dig myself too much of a hole during this ride. In my opinion, training to eat a ton of carbs on the bike is the best way to maintain the highest intensity possible and still have some glycogen reserves for the run, where it actually matters the most and where eating is harder, especially the final 10 to 15 kilometers. The bike is the warm up for the run under the nutrition aspect. The more we can take in, the better we will do on the run. Supplements. I kept supplementing on hard days with Four Endurance Fusion, a supplement that includes caffeine, green tea, ginseng, rhodiola, and noticeably lowers perceived exertion. I also experimented with Four Endurance Absolute, a mix of blood flow and vo 2 max improving ingredients. I took an iron supplement during the hardest four weeks, Sidran, to ensure that I didn't suffer from low iron. I only actually had a couple of days where I felt off, and I think it was due to iron, and the supplement fixed it immediately. What did I do slash went wrong during this training build? So the first biggest thing, injury. Apart from a minor three-day bout with some plantar fasciitis, so not even an injury, but a niggle, the biggest problem I had was a fairly serious injury, one month out from Nice. Not a niggle, but a full-blown injury. In a moment of distraction, while walking around barefoot, which I never do, I always protect my toes with sliders plus socks or shoes, I hit my toe on the leg of a table, stubbing it really badly. Pain was insane, and for a couple of days, I couldn't understand if it was broken or not. It was blue, it was a bit swollen, it was terrible. More than that, I couldn't believe such a ridiculously small distraction could potentially be leading to such big consequences. I was 80% sure it wasn't broken, as I'd already broken a couple of toes in the past years, and the pain was a lot worse, especially when sleeping. But how long would it take to recover? The situation was not ideal. This injury eventually recovered, but it forced me to take an eight day break from running right when the final key session was going to be. Navigating this injury was a pretty big mental test, to be honest because I had to keep myself in the game and believe that it would heal. And trust me, when you are so invested in a project, having something like this happen really sucks. But I kept at it, substituting runs for bikes and lower leg squats. I mimicked the long run on Sunday by doing a very, very hard muscular based effort on a steep climb on my bike. And I'm not kidding, I got up top and I did 15 minutes of bodyweight squats. This torched my legs and I think was a fairly good way of replicating running fatigue without the impact. What did I learn from this? Protect your toes, always. These little foot extensions are possibly one of the most vulnerable and fundamental parts of our bodies. And if you break one, especially the pinky or the thumb or the index, it could be game over. The other thing that this injury led me to fundamentally understand is distractions cost dearly. Distractions are really something that we need to strive to avoid during the day-to-day, -day, because distractions are really something that if we are on point, and on point means both physically and mentally, if we are on our game, we cannot let distractions like this happen, especially with a big project. And also I learned to really distinguish between a niggle and a full-blown injury. There is a big difference between a niggle, which is a lot of times people think a niggle is an injury. A niggle is not an injury. A niggle means there is some pain, but we are not like mechanically compromised. Like we couldn't train, it would just hurt. An injury is when you cannot train. You can't put weight on your foot. You can't run, you just can't, you couldn't do it. So making a distinction and knowing when our body is injured versus has a niggle, something that I'm always learning day to day, build to build. I'm always learning there is a big difference between these things and how to navigate them. The only real problem I had from this injury was I was supposed to do the last key session, 27 kilometer run on the Sunday when I did the low cadence workout plus squats. So I had to push the long run session to the following week, which in turn led me to messing up the taper. I will cover this a bit more extensively in the race recap video, but yeah, I had to push the final long run to a week later in schedule. During the Hamburg build, I think the taper went really well, so I didn't want to change anything. But injuring my toe made me switch the session that I thought to be a really key session to the following week, even though I knew it was risking it a bit. But I thought I could recover from it. 
Well, I did recover, but I probably should have taken away some of the sessions from the race week to make room for more recovery. Instead, I did them all. This, I think, was a big mistake that I think led me to be a bit more fatigued on race day and not quite as fresh as I could have been. Letting the training take over my life. Training is a tool for personal development, in my opinion. Racing is a tool to see what we are made of physically and mentally and testing us under pressure and seeing what comes out. I forgot this many times during the build, letting the training pretty much crush me and dictate what I could and could not do or how I was feeling. All that I should have done is simply extract myself from the situation I was in, take a bird's eye view and reassess the Training should be something that should enhance our quality of life, not crush it. And it should be, to some extent, enjoyable. Painful, but enjoyable. If I could go back, I would make sure to pay attention to this aspect and focus more on enjoying the journey. The single sessions are going to be hard, but it is a privilege and a choice to be able-bodied enough to train for these events. These months of training were a very, very formative experience. I learned a lot about myself, about my body, about my mind. I pushed through some limitations that I didn't think I could push through, to be honest. What I take away from these months is a lot of respect for my body and for my mind, and especially a lot of respect for health. Health is really a key aspect in our life that I believe is very, very often overlooked, or it is not really appreciated enough, in my opinion. I mean, I also oftentimes don't think what a privilege it is to be healthy and to be able to exercise outdoors, to push limits, to do these crazy events. And after this build, I really have a much, much deeper appreciation for health and for the luxury that health is. And being healthy over the long period is a thing that I strive to. I, I really want to age well, and I want to keep improving my health. This is also why I make these videos. I make these videos because I truly believe that Ironman 70.3 and full distance Ironman training, to some extent, can really provide the foundation of training aerobically and some strength stuff that can be done over the course of a lot of years for a long time. It's an infinite game, in my opinion. There's always another race, there's always another event, but the training is really what basically makes an Ironman important. What makes an Ironman important? Yes, it's the event, it's the medal, but the medal is only important because of all the training, sacrifice, uh, the hard sessions and all the character building moments that happen in training. Training is where, in my opinion and in my experience, the magic happens. This is where Iron Man really transforms us. The day of the event is a bit more of transcendence. So on the day of the event, if everything goes to plan, if all the training has been done right and we've trained our mind to push through, I believe on race day we can kind of like transcend what we thought was possible and that can be in and of itself a great experience but it is fundamentally linked to the hard work and to the day to day yes i will say it it's a grind it is a grind ironman training and 70.3 training is a grind let's not make any mistake about this some people also say it's it's boring i don't believe so i believe it is in itself a really great experience because in some way that i can't really pinpoint and it is very different from other sports it really does transform us. I mean, it transforms me. I feel very different when I'm doing a proper Ironman build compared to when I'm just out gravel riding or trail running, basically, both on the physical and mental aspect. And I come away from this training build, especially with a lot of love for the sport. This sport, well, actually, lifestyle is amazing. It is really amazing. It is something that has transformed my life, but it has transformed so many other people's lives. Probably you who are watching this video, your life has been transformed by this, by training, by being diligent by applying yourself to a really tough goal like a 70.3 or an Ironman and even just deciding to take on a goal like this is something that in my opinion can be really life-changing and definitely something worth pursuing. So that was the video of the training build for the Ironman World Championship in Nice. Stay tuned for the race recap video dropping next week. It's going to have a ton of information on tough Ironmans, how to handle a tough Ironman, a hilly course, a non-wetsuit swim, which was a first time for me. And honestly, one of the things I am most proud of of the Ironman World Championships, getting done the whole full distance swim without a wetsuit. That video is coming soon, as well as a lot of other videos. These videos take a lot of time to make. In the meantime, I've done my first ultra trail marathon, 55K. I've done a gravel race, so more content coming. Subscribe to the channel, give the video a like if you find it useful, and happy training.